Welcome everyone. I'm Joshua Merritt and I'll be moderating today's session. So let's go ahead and dive straight into today, today's topic. It's no secret that companies are under attack. Passwords are not sufficient protection against today's threats. Many companies today, they're starting to take advanced steps to protect themselves, to protect their customers and their employees from becoming victims, but the impact of those steps just isn't always quite enough. And today, that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about the best way to make big gains in security without lengthy consulting projects, without those projects that break your budget. Our experts are going to show you the difference between today's very common, uh, underwhelming, common static authentication methods that rely on simple call and response methods to allow access, and much smarter, much more secure, dynamic methods which use the data that you already have on hand to make smart decisions that keep these bad actors out altogether. So let's, let's get straight to it. Let's introduce our experts and, and let's get started. We're joined today by Kent Purdy from NetIQ, and we also have Jim Gherkin from NovaCoast. Kent and I are really thrilled today to have Jim on the call. He has a wealth of firsthand experience helping major companies implement dynamic authentication solutions, just like the ones that we're introducing to you today. So we're very excited to hear his perspective. Kent, that's really it for me, so I'm just going to get straight to it and hand it over to you. Thanks, Josh. Appreciate that. We probably don't need to have dwell too much time on the uh, the breach discussion. We, we all know that every one of us is going to be breached. In fact, five out of six large companies last year were breached. Verizon noticed that 700 million companies overall were breached with 60% targeted at the small media size business. So we're all, all of us going to be breached and a big part of how they happen is through phishing. Spear phishing was number one last year in terms of outsiders and criminals getting in. It's going to be number one again this year. In fact, eight out of ten intrusion breaches were enabled by stolen credentials. Someone got username and password and got into yours or mine or someone else's environment that was breached. And while education is key, a key part of solving that problem, as long as you have users you're going to have the problem because people are people. We all do dumb things. And now we have a higher ability to do dumb things because we have multiple devices. Today, uh, according to a strategy analytics here on, on the uh, slide, we have a couple devices per user. In a few years, we're going to have over four, an average of four devices per each user. For me, I have a lot more than that today. And the reason why that's the problem is because you don't control all those devices. You don't even know they exist. And if that's not complicated enough, a lot of times people are using those personal devices to access services and resources outside of your, out, out in the cloud, outside of your firewall. Remember those good old days when the firewall was like layer one protection that everyone took for granted? For those uh, applications and services out in the cloud, you don't even have that. Your user credentials are the front and too often the only line of protection for those uh, services. So, you know, a lot of folks would react, well, just take away personal devices, just retract and, and lock them down. Well, you really can't do that because that ship has already sailed. There's no way you can go back and do that. And, and if you did that, you would be inhibiting uh, business users and productivity anyway. So the fact is we have to live with uh, username and passwords credentials. And we have to think about the fact that 8 out of 10 of the times that we're intruded upon or breached upon is through breached or stolen credentials. In fact, you're going to uh, read uh, not only about uh, phishing going on, but you're going to read uh, this week just like you did last week if you're keeping an eye out for it about some case of stolen credentials, either through a database in a cloud getting uh, hacked or through uh, someone's laptop that had a full list of them. Every week, without even trying hard, you're going to be able to find a situation where that credential has been compromised. So while passwords is a line of defense, they really aren't your only defense. So today, we're going to look at a much better way than just traditional credentials. Jim and I are going to talk about the importance of context 
and show how you can leverage user and device information to verify the user's identity before giving access. We'll review authentication approaches that your organization should consider for their environment. We'll give you an introduction to NetIQ access management solutions, including risk-based authentication technology that makes context-driven uh, authentication easier. Jim's going to review situations where organizations have upgraded from static authentication to a dynamic one and how they did that. Jim's also going to recommend how to switch from static to dynamic authentication. And finally, we'll answer your questions about dynamic authentication, best practices, and about what NetIQ has to offer. So Jim, does that sound like a plan? Absolutely, Ken. That sounds like a good plan. Um, so to get, let's, to get started, let's go ahead and play a quick game, Should I Let Him In? So we see this person, Should I Let Him In? Now, I am the security guard at a museum. I've got millions of dollars of art to protect. And this guy walks up, lets himself in through the front door using the keys and the code, walks up to my desk, and carrying his bag of tools, he's got gloves on and a mask, should I let him in? So, first question is, he started out with his username and password. He had the key and the code to the door. So, yeah, he's got a username and password. Let's go ahead and let him in. That doesn't necessarily work for us. I'm sure a lot of you were shaking your head no, you know, kind of like at the movies. Some of you might have been yelling at the screen, don't let him in, don't let him in. But this is more than just looking at his credentials. What we were all doing if we were saying no is taking a look at his context. So sure, his credentials are accurate. Yes, he should at least be here in the building or he has enough to get into the building. But why is he wearing a mask? Is it because it's cold outside? Is it necessarily, you know, to disguise his face? Would he mind taking off the mask? Uh, what's in the bag, right? And those are his tools. Well, why is he here? Is he just bringing tools, or is he here to fix the, you know, HVAC? It's cold outside, and the heaters aren't working, and the art's very sensitive to temperature swings. So he was called in the middle of the night um, to fix the HVAC. Or he doesn't have good answers to all of these, so I would deny access. So judging whether I should let him in isn't based purely upon his credentials. He had the right credentials, but no, I'm going to call the police because we didn't call the HVAC and, you know, three in the morning nobody should be here with a mask here in Miami, Florida. So while we're working with our context, right, context can be a lot of different items. Take a look at all of the different types of data that you would use to make that kind of decision. Right? We know where a person's coming from. We know what a person is trying to do. Right? So we know their location. We know their, the time of day that they're trying to access this. We know what the data is, what computer they're on probably. And then we can also, through trending and tracking and analytics, take a look at what they normally do. Have they always done this in the past, or is there something different about this time? Yeah, so there's two, there's two key pieces here that Jim's talking about. There's the, there's the behavior of the user. Is he doing things that we expect him to do, uh, or is there an anomaly there? And then there's another consideration of how to leverage this context is, do we care? Is that person trying to access something that really is offers no harm to the, the business or is low risk or is it a, or is it sensitive is it something that really uh, is, is something that the business needs to pay attention to and protect their exposure to well said Ken. so I've got another slide that will really kind of put that into perspective the things that we're trying to to take a look at so with this slide the first thing we have to do is we have to actually gather that context information and build the context so taking a look at those elements, those parameters, those bits of information that we just talked about, location, etc. Second, we need to go ahead and analyze that information to determine an assurance level or a risk level moving forward with this. Is this a low risk, a medium risk, or a high risk? Right? You may have more granular definitions, but you have to categorize it to make a decision. 
And then second, you have to take an action, right? Are you going to allow this access? Are you going to do something to remediate the risk or, or, or provide better assurance? Or are you going to deny access? So it can be as simple as that. Ken, does that really make sense? Now, now is the perfect place to talk about the hows. How do we go from static to dynamic? Yeah. Sure thing. So one of the first things is when you're dealing with this, it's really not a too complicated a process, right? First step is going to be do your homework, right? I mean, we always say that, and it's kind of trite of me to say it, but, yeah, you have to start out figuring out what you need to do. Identify your tasks. You know what most of your users are supposed to be doing. You may have to get a little more granular and figure out what some of the dangerous things that they're doing, right? If you're a bank, are people allowed to do large transactions, right? That's a risk. You might lose a lot of money if, well, people are doing large transactions. People don't steal money a dollar at a time usually. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to identify those tasks. And once you've got that list of tasks built up, you have to decide if the context information really changes the risk of those tasks. So transferring a dollar at a time doesn't seem like a big threat, but what if I'm transferring a dollar at a time 10 times a second? I'm doing this task a lot more frequently than I should be. Well, I can lose a lot of money real fast. Or am I transferring this money all to one place and, and it's not in this country, right? And I'm a regional bank. So I need to really determine if those extra parameters, uh, my context uh, data, really changes the risk of my task. And then, yeah, what are we going to do? Uh, maybe it's appropriate for blocking sometimes, but if I block all the time when there's a medium or high risk, my people won't be able to work. So are there other things I can do? Add additional user verification or authentication to ensure that that's the user who's authorized to do this, that it's really a user and not maybe you know a botnet that's doing this, um, and also that it is something that I want to allow and, and assume the risk for. So you, t you tailor your response to the context. Second, you're going to build the solution with some tools, of course. Right? So I've gathered the context of my user tasks. I put together all of the, the, uh, the, what my people are doing. But now I have to figure out, can I gather that data? Do my tools allow me to gather that information to make those decisions, to build those contexts? Second, when I'm building one of these solutions, it really, really helps to put policy in a central place. If I am trying to build policy in 10 different applications to enforce this policy consistently across my organization, I will have changes and deltas in the policy. I will have a lot of work to keep it all consistent. And my users will probably detect that and figure out that, well, if I use this system over here, I can do what I want. But if I use that system over there, I can't. So I'll always use the one that lets me do what I want. Um, so I, centralizing policies really is an important piece. Clearly, they need to be automated as much as possible. Right? We're talking about a lot of requests, a lot of tasks, people doing work. And we don't want to put other people in the mix. Do I need to check with somebody every time I want to do a, a transaction at the bank? That would just slow us all down. So taking a look at those, I need a centralized piece, a centralized tool that meets those requirements. And then are there ways that I can even expand that and make that better? So can I gather data and inject it into the system for other useful parameters? So for example, when I see geolocation, great, that tells me where I'm doing my task. But now the concept of geo-velocity, where was I five minutes ago? So if I was in the building, in the office, five minutes ago, but now I'm in a different continent doing this from somewhere halfway around the world, geo-velocity says, I probably couldn't get there physically to do that. So that most likely isn't me. That's someone else doing that. Um, so comparing that other information data about where I was previously and when that 
other geolocation was really helps me make some important decisions. If I was in China, great. If all I know is I'm in China, can I make a decision based upon that? If I was in China, but I was in you know New Jersey five minutes ago, yeah, that's probably not me in China. And take your, you know, does this address some of my easy uh, problems? Web solutions, you know, web applications are all over the place. So are those my my big wins? Are those the things that I really want to capture first? So next, how am I going to address the risk? Authentication is a great way to address risk. Right? I can verify a user. I can validate that that is that user at that session by using an active authentication, um, something other than password where passwords can be automated. Is it, uh, I can even assign risk, right? So if, you know, you put your finger on the uh, fingerprint reader, you're saying that, yes, I am uh, authorized to do this, and yes, I am supposed to do this. And so, yeah, the, the user's got some skin in the game as well. But also, my users are going to come in a lot of flavors, so I'll need to make sure that if I'm going to use authentication, I can use the methods, the various methods that will work for my users. Not everybody has a smartphone. Not everybody can read. Um, you know, we have ADA to comply with, etc. So make sure that you can address the risk across the board, and not just for a limited set of users. Finally. That policy that you define is going to be dynamic. So my policy engine needs to serve up a dynamic policy. I don't want to craft a lot of static policies to handle all of the possible decisions. I want to use authentication. That's how I'm going to mediate that risk. That's how I'm going to go ahead and handle my, my medium risk situation. So since I'm going to go ahead and use authentication, my authentication policy should determine which authentication type I should use for a particular user. Let my authentication policy determine that. I don't have to craft 16 different use this type of authentication to move through a particular type of decision tree or a particular policy. I can just say users in this group in Active Directory use tokens. Users in this group in Active Directory use certificates. And then just let my dynamic policy say, user in the appropriate group, ah, okay, if they use this type of authentication. And again, I, I can't say it enough, central policy really does make for a consistent user experience. If users need to carry a ring of, of, of tokens, right, instead of a ring of keys, you know, it'll be the same old story. They're trying the token, they time themselves out. Now we've just changed the problem of using multiple passwords to using multiple tokens because I didn't centralize it. If I can centralize it, I can call the one token whenever I need from whichever situation I might have. All right, so I've laid out a lot of requirements for this solution. You know, I've described something that seems pretty complicated. Kent, Nike, you must have a solution for this. Yes, what a great intro. Jim, I appreciate the, the walking through the house of that. Now is a good time to talk about a couple of the solutions that NetIQ does offer. NetIQ Access Manager, because it's been around a long time, it's been around for well over 10 years. People think about it for, as a web access management tool for intranets. It's been well regarded by the analysts. It continues to be a top rated solution. And it's, it's what people think about when they need a solution to deliver that single sign-on and access control for their internet environments. But too often, folks mistakenly don't think about Access Manager for their cloud needs. The reality is Access Manager has mature uh, technologies available for cloud-based services. It has full support for SAML, WSS Fed, OAuth, OpenID Connect. Not a problem at all. It's quite uh, straightforward to configure. For those cloud services that aren't mature enough to have those federation technologies, Access Manager has, is able to use that, uh, its gateway that made it so well, so uh, robust in the internet out in the cloud as well to provide that same level of access control, experience control, and single sign-on to those uh, cloud services. And we also, Access Manager has a, uh, a browser plugin that can provide a single sign-on to cloud services where that provides the best fit. So there really is not a situation where Access Manager doesn't provide 
a great solution for cloud-based services. Also, increasingly, uh, businesses and other organizations are looking for ways to personalize their interaction with their customers by consuming social identities. Cloud Access Manager does that as well. You can consume just about any kind of uh, social identity that can federate. And that, by doing so, you're able to not only personalize those experiences, but you're able to allow private access by your customers or partners. Uh, or you could even allow uh, financial transactions by using NetIQ's technology to raise the level of verification from beyond just a social identity, but to a validated identity. And that's going to, be, that's going to happen through risk-based and advanced authentication. And for those larger uh, environments where uh, you prefer, you may, you may have an IT operations group that has uh, an integration point and maybe a, a centralized console strategy, uh, Access Manager fits well into there with its RESTful APIs you can incorporate its capabilities into your management environment. So there's, there's, there's value in spending time here and thinking about all sorts of new and expanded ways that you can use Access Manager just beyond the traditional Internet WAN use case. Here's a good, uh, a good shot of uh, uh, Access Manager's uh, risk-based policy engine for situations where step-up uh, authentication is required. The key value here is that it's built right inside of Access Manager. This is not another uh, set of pieces that you need to deploy or purchase. You get it when you purchase Access Manager. And what this allows you to do is, as Jim's described, for situations where the business risk uh, or the, use, the, the risk that the user is imposing onto the business seems out of norm or is unacceptable, you can define a, a, a step-up authentication to verify that user's uh, identity. And that's what authentication is all about. Authentication is verifying that the user is who he claims to be. And so can, 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 I, can I just cut in here real fast and ask you something? Sure. Because I'm, I'm hearing what both you and Jim are talking about, and I want to make sure that I'm connecting the pieces, that I'm getting the big picture um, as we keep moving through this. It sounds like you're saying that right now, Many companies are using NetIQ Access Manager as kind of a tried and true web access management solution. Uh, so they're using it as a WAM. But you're saying that there's a lot more functionality built in. And in fact, Access Manager, I guess this is what I want your validation on, Access Manager includes everything you need to move to dynamic authentication, right? It has centralized policy management. Jim was just going over this too. It has built-in risk scoring. It ticks off that list of requirements that Jim uh, uh, provided forward just a few minutes ago. Is that right? Is that kind of what you're getting at? It's right, and it does it in a way that doesn't require that level of special knowledge. That that uh, a lot of solutions are are they they have every bell and whistle that you can imagine, mm -hmm. but you have to have that expertise to make it happen. Access Manager lets the typical administrator that's been using WAM these past years make that extension without a lot of hurdles uh, to make it happen. Mm, got it, thank you. So here's a list of uh, uh, easy to use, uh, straightforward uh, metrics to implement that Access Manager provides. You can get a simple, uh, uh, you know what, if their folks are out of the building, they can't access that specific doc. In fact, when you look at the current regulations, federal healthcare related, that you just addressed those right there, where there, there's these types of documents you cannot be, you cannot access if you're outside the building without verifying through another factor of authentication the user is who he says. So that's a very simple way to become compliant to those regulations. Uh, you can get more uh, sophisticated as you need to. Uh, Jim talked about geolocation and all the sophisticated things you can do. That you can uh, access manager integrates those solutions. We also have an integration with Cisco uh, Identity Security Engine. So you can do all sorts of deep dive uh, based on all sorts of device attributes and network uh, segment attributes, whether or not you can uh, require another level of authentication. So from the simple to the, the more complete, uh, it's all built in and included with Access Manager. Also, too often customers' prospects don't think about Access Manager for their mobile solution. Access Manager includes an SDK for those customers that are developing a native environment. They really want that extra graphical rich experience for their users so their, 
they're developing a native mobile app. NetIQ has an SDK that offloads the usage and management and security of credentials to access those applications. And you, 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 there's probably several of you know here on the call, most often your mobile developers are not the security experts. Having them being responsible for, for securing that credential or that token is not the best idea to have. And not only is, are they really not experts in it, it's a big time drain. Uh, because not only do you need to do that, but there's all the single sign-on uh, um, operations that typically need to happen on the back end. A lot of your most valuable mobile applications, when they select uh, certain options in that app, are accessing different back-end services, the same back-end services that, they're, were, that they were accessing uh, on their desktop inside the Internet a few years ago, uh, is now going to the phone. You're going to put all that onus on your developer if you don't find a solution uh, that offloads that capability like what Access Manager provides. Also for uh, organizations that are taking more of a, of a cross-platform mobile approach that are implementing mobile apps in the hybrid fashion, Access Manager has uh, fully supports OpenID Connect uh, and is tested. They could use that for your, your cross-platform approach. And also for your legacy applications, uh, and especially for applications that you have built to be dynamic, that are mobile friendly, that adjust to the form factor, Access Manager in a very simple way lets you define an app mark and push it out to your mobile devices. And so what your users would do is they would download the NetIQ mobile access app on either the Apple iStore or the uh, Google Play. And within that, based on what the administrator has set up, users would have access, single sign-on access, or in other words, one icon touch access to the applications that were heretofore on the uh, on you know laptops and desktops. Very easy. It can be done in an afternoon or shorter than that uh, after, after you get good at that. And so when you think about if you're like most organizations, which according to the analysts are having a hard time with their native mobile app projects, they're taking much, much longer uh, than anticipated. Meantime, you could use Access Manager within an afternoon to get those applications on your device uh, to, for today. There's a lot of value there. So Access Manager does include time-based OTP and uh, Google Authenticator support, but for those that need broader uh, support or broader options and the times, kinds of authentication methods they need to gain access to, NetIQ offers advanced authentication framework where we're very aggressive on supporting the latest, greatest uh, readers and devices on the market. So you have the full uh, options to choose what fits your environment best. It's also that same approach works very well for consolidating multiple uh, authentication frameworks into a single place because as Jim talked about earlier, if you, the more places you have your policies, the more, the higher probability you're going to have those policies be disparate, where someone's role changes, they either change roles or they leave the organization, they leave the company, and not every single door was shut when that happened. That, that's a higher risk the more places you have those policies defined. And the fact that we, NetIQ is very aggressive in the kinds of devices they'll support, lets you centralize all those policies to a single framework. Also, for these newer devices <coughs> that are FIDO compliant, NetIQ is one of the first vendors to be certified FIDO uh, compliant. Uh, and I'll, I'll not, you can read about the, the web-based for, for easy access and high availability. You, you can use one configuration of advanced authentication framework for your entire organization worldwide uh, because of the way that it's, uh, it's structured. So with that, I think, uh, Jim, it would be very uh, interesting and useful for you to talk about some case studies on organizations that have moved from their static username and password over to a dynamic authentication environment. Sure thing. So one of our customers is an insurance company in the Midwest, and the problem that they were facing is a mobile workforce. Nobody's in the office. They're all out being agents, and not only are they mobile mobile, they work from remote offices, so they don't have the standard just log in piece, right? I, they don't just come into the office, log in, and do it every day in and out. They're moving around doing all kinds of different things. 
So because of this, they had originally set it up such that passwords didn't expire very often, actually just didn't expire. So when the auditors saw that, they said, you have to fix that. You have to do stronger authentication. And luckily, that's the wording that the auditors used. So the customer turned around and looked at what can we do with our users and passwords. And they really came to the conclusion that their users just hated passwords and making passwords more complicated were only going to make work harder for the users and more work for the help desk. So they decided to augment passwords. And now, when a user logs into these web applications that they access remotely to do their work, they've got their password. And it's still somewhat of a, of a weak password. But they also add in some other functions, such as we've all seen it. I log into my bank, and it says, hey, I haven't seen you from this workstation. Can you validate that you are who you say you are? And I'm going to send you maybe a, a token to your phone or a, an email. And then I'll register that workstation. And also, not only have I not seen that, but I'm going to go beyond password and ask you for some of your challenge response questions, you know, your question and answers, your secondary authentication pieces. So those are the same questions they use for self-service if they forgot their password. So it's a simple uh, setup. They don't have six different sets of uh, questions to answer, just one. And they can use it for both authentication in a primary model and authentication when they've forgotten something like their password. And then since everybody lived and died by the phone, not necessarily a smartphone, but a phone, they also added an SMS factor, an OTP via SMS. So they had all of these different models to build stronger authentication while not really addressing the weak of passwords. Sure, they kept the password just because it's a method that everybody is familiar with, but they added all of this other information to make it stronger. So they didn't fix passwords, they added to passwords. And that allowed them to pass their audit and have strong authentication. Great way to address user population issues. Another customer, a manufacturer, is a highly regulated manufacturer at that. So they've got lots of different acronym sets to comply with. Some, most of which we don't normally have to comply with in business, right? This isn't just your standard HIPAA, SOX, and PCI. This is a bunch of different sets of letters. They are contemplating Office 365. Office 365 as a way to get rid of your burden of managing Office applications, but also back-end Office applications, and to provide high availability to those what we're now considering critical applications, and I'll do it without any addition or significant additional IT spend. Office 365 provided value to them, but how do you make that work in a highly regulated environment? So they needed to add some features that would make Office 365 more secure. They decided that there were certain risks, the tasks that were risky, were the movement of not only intellectual property, but sensitive data. Those are the tasks that they were concerned with. By putting it out to Office 365, now they didn't necessarily have control, right? It could be anywhere, it could be any when, it could be, um, you know, my machine, your machine, and that all of those combinations made the risk too high. So they said, well, yeah, we'd love Office 365, but we'd have to block everything that people would use it for. You can't email documents because you might be emailing sensitive documents. So they wound up taking a step back and saying, okay, how do we, again, address these risk concerns? So if they put in something like DLP, they can classify data. And then if they put in some controls, they can control the movement <coughs> of that data and make it so that users can't necessarily move that data. Right? So I can read a sensitive document, but if I try to pull it out and then email it to someone, since it's encrypted in my DLP solution, they wouldn't be able to necessarily read it where I sent it to. That protects me. But still, that idea of being able to pull it out, where can I pull it out to? They still have the gap of, well, I can pull it out to any device. Well, I didn't want that either. So we wound up finding a way to 
take authentication for access or for Office 365, which today, right, it just does federation for most most organizations, most enterprises. It comes back to us for authentication, and our access manager does the federation, which means that I'm really looking at an access manager login page and authentication method for Office 365. Well, now I've got control of authentication again, which is great because now I can extend authentication. And we wound up with a policy that says, well, if they're on a managed device and they're a, an approved user, they are allowed to do some of these high-risk tasks. So first, a managed device. Great. What do we do to do managed devices? Well, we're using AirWatch. We're using you know, an MDM. We're using you know, some other applications. And all of those would leave a fingerprint on the device, whether it be a certificate or particular applications or agents that we could query. So first, we authenticated the device. And then we would come in and authenticate the user, take those two pieces and say, well, does this plus some of the context information, again, that highly regulated. There are some companies where they're not allowed to do business. So first, are we not are we coming in from a, uh, an allowed geolocation or are we in a prohibited geolocation? And then we would go ahead and step, you know, step it up and apply that application, apply that authentication and make sure that we are actually reading that and tying that together. So they were able to take Office 365, which they originally declared to be too insecure and secure it enough to allow, again, to address those risk concerns that now that they can use it. Last use case is an enter a large entertainment company. So we have a large entertainment company over here on the West Coast that has a lot of partners. And they're not employees. It's really external users, right? That's the way the entertainment user, uh, the entertainment industry works. There's a bunch of different companies that all come together to make a movie, for example. So they are concerned with things like lateral movement. If I can log in here, can I log in in other places and get access to stuff that I shouldn't get access to? So they needed a way to trigger authentication, not only on, yes, it needs to be strong authentication to let you in the front door, but for certain areas of the system, we're going to block the lateral movement. We're not going to do single sign-on. We're going to go ahead and turn that into single sign-on for low risk, but re-authenticate all the time for high risk. And how do you do that with strong authentication when you have a lot of users who wouldn't accept tokens, would always forget tokens? You know, how do I come up with a way to make a policy that says everybody who might use any kind of authentication method that I allow and might not use all the other authentication methods that I allow, how do I get a hold of that? So they wound up with a policy that allows them to basically offer a few different types of authentication methods, and then the person the, who's getting in can choose from which one they want to normally use as their primary and which one they want to use as their secondary. And so now they can build that solution. Again, that dynamic policy lets us address all of those different situations. So the advantages that we saw for everybody, right, is that the insurance company was able to use a simple web interface to address the external users and detect and apply strong authentication without you know, adding too much to the users. They didn't have to carry a, a key ring full of tokens or add a bunch of software and agents to their workstations. The entertainment company likes that it works with any authentication method. So later on, when their partner execs start demanding Apple Watch authentications, they can provide it. This solution can be integrated with systems that use existing authentication methods or new authentication methods because of the standard APIs and integration methods. And then the manufacturer liked that the policies are defined in standard terms, managed devices, strong authentication, and didn't require a lot of programming to implement. We could leverage what they already had in ways that, that everybody understood to build a, to craft a solution that didn't get in the way. Now, how do you get started with this? So first, again, identify your needs, right? What does my organization look like, right? Where are my tasks and data? 
what do I need to really get a handle on? Once I've defined all of that, w the way my people work, the tasks that you're trying to accomplish, and you know how I'm going to assign risk, start with your low-hanging fruit. Web application, whether it's cloud or in the data center, is a really easy low-hanging fruit. You don't have to worry about different applications on the front end and integrating with those. You just have to worry about browser support, web infrastructure, and if you're using NetIQ Access Manager, it's a proxy that a lot of this is already going through for web access management or single sign-on. So let's just extend that. Start with your simple behaviors. Okay, are these tasks time sensitive or geolocation sensitive or workstation sensitive? Get into complicated things like behavior analysis and, and, and is this normal later on, right? You have to build up a data set to determine all that. You have to, you know, baseline all of that behavior anyway. So rather than just turn it on and get no value while you uh, amass those metrics, go ahead and start with your simple parameters first. Second, take a look at your user population. A single authentication policy rarely works for everyone. I don't have a single customer who has said, you know what, we are going to use this particular method, tokens, hard tokens, across the board because everybody loves it. There's always different needs, different populations, and different pricing models, right? I wouldn't give RSA tokens or hard tokens out to, you know, my 2.7 million customers. That's just not going to work. I need something smarter, something cheaper. So take a look at that, and I encourage everybody to take a look at ADA compliance needs, right? Um, not everybody addresses that, but it is something that today, username and passwords plug into all of our ADA extensions for our workstations and our devices. Not all of these authentication methods do, so choose wisely. Finally, balance your security and your efficiency. You are basically setting up a system that says you are allowed, you, authentication, versus something that's a more dynamic. So don't go too far on the complexity. Don't go hog wild on, I'm going to compare every possible one of those you know, parameters, uh, gather a context that's really, really rich. I'm going to plug in full you know, uh, behavior analysis and determine whether this is not only uh, normal, but also the person's intentions. So once you get to that complexity, think of how much work you're really trying to do to define those policies. Your policy matrix doesn't fit an Excel spreadsheet anymore. You, you know, you've got 16 different, you know, mate, uh, axes for making a decision. Um, you've got people who have to put in those policies and key in those policies. Even if it's in one place, if they've got to type 20 lines, there's a chance that they're going to make an error. So don't get too complicated. Keep it simple. And then your users always avoid processes where it's too hard. Right? If you make their, their tasks significantly more complicated, they will find a way around your security. That's been true since the beginning of computers and the beginning of computer security. So we're going to have to deal with users. We're going to have to make sure it's something that they can work in. And last, again, centralization. I I've said it before, just keep that in mind. So Kent, where can yeah. I find more information? That, that, that's perfect. Thanks so much for uh, for setting us up there, Jim. Uh, we're just getting ready to shift into a, a great Q&A session. We've got several questions that have already come in. Before we do jump into that real quick, I wanted to take a quick moment just to give you this next step uh, for learning even more. Kit pulled this together. If you go to netiq.com slash tomorrow's authentication, uh, there's some really great resources. There's a great white paper there um, on how today's risks require tomorrow's authentication and thinking ahead and starting to lay out that plan and that framework just like we've talked about today. So I'm going to leave the URL uh, up here on the screen for you to copy down or go ahead and click through to bookmark uh, and we'll shift over into the Q&A. It's not too late to submit some questions, but we do have a few good ones already here uh, on deck. So I'm just going to throw these out. Ken and Jim, you guys kind of step in and take them uh, as, as you see fit. Uh, the first one that comes in is just about uh, access manager and the, and the solution that we've, that we've put forward today. The question is, does this work with cloud-based apps like Salesforce? Absolutely. Yep, it, yeah. it, it, it has full federation for sure. Right, and some cloud-based applications you can use uh, even granular URL control if you are running it through the proxy function. 
Hmm. Yeah, uh, maybe a small, this is a little bit outside of this discussion, but if you, if you need some really um, robust uh, account management, there's another NetIQ product uh, called Cloud Access that has even stronger uh, integration with uh, Salesforce than Access Manager does. Oh, good, good. And, and then this one's more around uh, deployment, really. How long does it take? You know, I, I, I queued this up at the beginning and I said, hey guys, listen, we're not going to pitch a solution to you that, um, that requires a lengthy consulting gig and, and drains the budget. How long does this take if someone decided that they wanted to roll this out today? So being a consulting partner, right, I mean, numbers are numbers, but I'm going to say that if you're using Access Manager today and you want to add dynamic dynamic authentication or risk-based authentication, mm -hmm. you've got a little bit of work to do, figuring out your homework. Mm -hmm. That's going to be specific to everybody. That might be you know a couple of days, it might be a, a couple of weeks. But once you implement it, it's really something that is you can snap right in. The, the pieces that we've shown that add into Access Manager snap in, you can define your policies and have that all up and running and tested in a week or two, mm. right? Depending again on that matrix, right? If it's 65 parameters to make a decision, yes, that's going to take a lot longer to implement. But if you're doing some basics and you're doing a simple authentication process, a couple of weeks. If you don't have any of this, it's going to take, you know, just a, a short amount of time, usually a month or two, to really, you know, fully figure out what you want to do with it and then snap it into place. Great, great. But it's not six months. It's not a year. We're talking about, you know, a, a few weeks uh, if you've got every, all your homework in place and, and no more than a month or two, uh, it sounds like, if, if you need to start uh, fresh from the beginning. Yeah, the right. biggest and, variable really is that homework slide that, that, that Jim walked yeah. through. I mean. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what about disaster recovery? That's a question that just came in that I thought, wow, you know what, we didn't really talk much about that. Um, it, does this support any disaster recovery scenarios, and, and how do you see that really playing out? So all of these components are, have built-in clustering, so you can automatically build in a multi-server environment with shared distributed centralized policy, and that can be applied to disaster recovery, business continuity, just to the fact that you live in multiple locations. Simple enough. Really, I mean, with the appliance model that they've got built into the into the NetIQ Access Manager and advanced authentication, it is as simple as deploy a new appliance. Cool. Yeah. So this one actually moves a little bit away from the technology and talks a little bit more just about the, the principles behind dynamic authentication. Um, this is actually a really good question. I'm interested in, in hearing what you guys say. What are the most commonly used risk metrics? What are people looking at? So far, what we run into are the basics. Mm -hmm. Where, when, and what workstation. Okay. So keeping it simple. And, and is that kind of a, that's what people are using. Is that is that a, a good start? Is that something that you recommend as kind of look? Start here and then kind well, of that's a great out. start simply okay. because it's something that's built in. It's something that everybody understands, right? I mean, if I say that, you know, hey, I just want to geofence my competitor's building so that you can't access this application from my competitor's home office, mm -hmm. people understand that argument, right? It's yeah. really simple. So, Good, good. I like simple. I think everyone on this on this call probably likes simple. You want something powerful. You want something that's uh, that's simple and, e and easy to push forward. On, on that front, around simplicity, I think this is we've got about two more questions here. So if, if you've got anything else, please go ahead and send them in. Um, and 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 as always, we we try to be respectful of your time and and wrap up so that you can get to your next meetings. Um, this next question is: Do I have to put this on all of my applications? Uh, or make all of my users use two-factor authentication? No. That's simple, no. Too, right, I can put just a simple set of here are the applications that I collect or that I use the context metrics from and different sets of context metrics for each application. That's a simple enough policy to define. Second, how I address those those risk metrics, right? So if I am deciding that really all I'm really concerned is people cannot get to these applications 
in these states or countries or you know regions. Mm -hmm. That's all I need to do. I don't need to add two factor. But if I want to allow, because my CEO is trying to really open that market, he might be going over there. I need to make an exception. Great. Now I need to add two factor so that I can pop him in, but not anybody else. Wow. So you you can actually be that explicit. You can you can get that sure. that granular. Yeah. Cool. Um, this is this is the last question that we've got uh, on deck here. So s send over another one if there's anything top of mind. But this is a really interesting one that I hadn't even thought about. Uh, does this work with voice calls? Yes. So can you tell us a little bit about that. I mean, I'm dying. I almost didn't even. I was trying to imagine that scenario. Can you walk me through that? Sure. So those two methods, right, or the voice-based methods, phone-based methods, are just authentication methods, and we can again plug in any authentication method that exists out there. Um, so the ability to I may not have a smartphone so I can't use an OTP and I'm not going to use necessarily tasks uh, or uh, tokens right I don't want to carry a, a big key ring of full of tokens or I'm going to forget them or again ADA compliance I can't read that token so I can't get that OTP off I need to have it read to me then we can use basically any phone technology to make a phone call right our end might be VoIP or SIP and then we're calling out to whatever end device you've got and the computerized system reads you the OTP the one-time password that you need to then key in now that could be a loop system where voice recognition picks up the OTP and you plugs it right in for you or you type it in yourself so on and so forth but we can use voice calls to deliver that authentication token that you then need to, to plug in. So the something you have is the endpoint to receive that call. Fascinating. I hadn't even thought of that one. It's a great question. And, and that does cover all of the questions that, that we have submitted, Jim and Kent. So that will conclude our presentation for the day. Um, thanks again, Kent. Thanks, Jim, also for presenting today. And, and most importantly, we want to thank everyone for joining today from all of us here at NetIQ. Do be sure to visit us online at netiq.com. Take a look at this paper that Kent put forward at netiq.com slash tomorrow's authentication for more information. And stay tuned. Uh, we'll have plenty of webinars coming up that dive further into dynamic authentication as well. Thanks so much and have a great afternoon. Mm -hmm.